Good morning. Buenos días a todos. You are welcome to this webinar. Sois bienvenidos a este, a este webinar eh, sobre las oportunidades de colaboración eh, en, en el ámbito del biogás y la eólica flotante en el marco del Plan Nacional de Energías Renovables. Uh, you are welcome to this webinar on the partnering opportunities following the Spanish National Renewables Plan, focusing on flooding wind and biogas, that has been organized by the Renewable Energies Association Spain, APA, and the Department for uh, International Trade of the British Government. Uh, I'm going to continue just a little bit in Spanish. Uh, Solo para decir que hemos empezado a hacer estos webinars en la larga cuarentena que hemos vivido en España, en APA. Estamos encantados de, de, bueno, pues de, de cómo están funcionando y la oportunidad que nos están dando para, para, bueno, para compartir información y, y, bueno, y hacer networking con todas las, las empresas de, del sector de las renovables. Y os invitamos a participar en nuestros próximos webinars que serán el jueves 25 sobre eólica flotante, precisamente uno específico, y otro el, el, el día 30 sobre acceso y conexión. So, let's continue in English. Uh, it's our pleasure to, to be participating in this, in this webinar from, from, the, I mean, from the biomass department in APA. And I'll start with a presentation, short presentation, to let you know what's the situation of biogas in Spain. It's a very, very short, and it's just a kind of, uh, yes, uh, something to be used to, to ask questions later and to have a, a, a debate, you know? So, okay, you can go ahead. Ah, one, one thing before, before continuing. If you want to ask questions, you have two tools. You have a chat and also a questions and answers uh, button down, you know, on, at the bottom of the of the of your screen, and all the questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. So, please go ahead and and ask questions to all the all the panelists. Thank you very much. So we will continue. What's the situation of biogas in Spain? We have the most favorable framework ever. So we have the best, the best conditions to develop biomass and especially biogas now in Spain. Why? In terms of bioeconomy, we have the European bioeconomy strategy. So there is a, a, the, the European Commission is pushing bioeconomy and they publish um, the European strategy in 2012, they updated the strategy in 2017, and they created a bioeconomy knowledge center. So it aims to accelerate the, de the deployment of a sustainable European bioeconomy to maximize its contribution uh, to the 2030 agenda, the sustainable development goals, and many other objectives. We also have the Spanish bioeconomy strategy, Horizon 2030, and the objective is to place the bioeconomy as an essential part of national uh, economic activity. And also in Spain, some, region, some regions, some, uh, some uh, communities, you know, we are a kind of, it's not a federal state, but we have, our territories are, are autonomous. Uh, some of our autonomous territories are developing their own, their specific regional bioeconomy strategies. For example, Andalusia. Andalusia is the biggest Spanish territory, autonomous, and they have published a specific bioeconomy strategy whose general objective is to contribute to the sustainable growth and development of Andalusia by promoting actions aimed at boosting <coughs> the production of resources and renewable biological, biological processes. Next, please. We have also the, the, the best framework ever in terms of energy and climate. Not only because we have a new renewable energy directive published in 2018, very ambitious renewable energy directive, but also because 
we have uh, a specific national energy and climate plan in Spain that is said that is the most ambitious in the European Union. So by, 30, by 2030, we, ha we will have 42% of renewables in final energy consumption, 74% of renewables in the electrical system, and we aim to have a 23% of reduction of greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. We also have a Spanish climate change and energy transition law, first time in Spain, that is being processing right now in our parliament. So this draft is also very, very um, ambitious. Uh, Spain must achieve the climate neutrality no later than tw that by uh, 2050. By 2050, uh, the Spanish electricity system must be 100% renewable. And the other objectives are in the same, in the same line than this, the National Energy and Climate Plan. So they are aligned. So we have very, very ambitious energy and climate <coughs> uh, objectives also in Spain. And the next slide. And not only in bioeconomy and climate and energy, we also have the best framework <coughs> in other strategic areas, such as circular economy. We have not only the uh, circular economy action plan for cleaner and more competitive Europe that was published uh, some weeks ago by the, by the European Commission. Also, what go our government published a Spanish circular economy strategy, Circular Spain 2030 plan, uh, I think it was two weeks ago. And our government is focused in laying the foundation for overcoming the linear economy and promoting the new production and consumption model in all the different uh, sub-sector in Spain. Uh, waste, industry, energy. Um, so they want to close the productive circles, also in the agri, in the... In, in all the sectors, to, minim to minimize the generation of waste, to reuse. So we also have a draft on just transition um, because in Spain, we are planning to decommission the traditional fossil fuel plants. So our government is, go is working in this draft of uh, the strategy to optimize the results of the ecological transition for employment and to ensure that people and regions make the most of the opportunities of this transition and there is no one that is going to be left behind. And it's especially highlighting the areas where potential, where potential the commission of fossil fuel plants will take place. And our government is also working on uh, the Spanish demographic challenge strategy. You know, everyone now is, is, is <coughs> I mean, not now. Since 30 years ago, people want to live in cities where there are apparently more opportunities. And we want to balance a little bit. I mean, we need to really balance um, the situation also in rural areas. So this strategy uh, is looking for the quality of opportunities and rights of people regardless of where they live. Um, they are trying to promote innovative opportunities and investment and new industries to be settled in, in those areas. And apart from this uh, positive framework, our government is planning to design a specific Spanish biogas roadmap. They opened a public consultation that was closed last Friday, and they asked 15 general questions on targets, barriers, measures, uses of biogas. We answered this, this consultation, and I mean, we are very, it's like we've been working on this for more than 14 years and now it's like okay now is the time so now we are going to have a biogas roadmap so we are very excited uh, but our position is very 
strong, you know, because we really want a, 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 an effective uh, biogas roadmap in Spain. So we think it has to be ambitious. It needs to set progressive and compulsory targets for the different uses of biogas, electrical, thermal, transport, and injection. And we really need political will to, to do it, not only at national, also at regional levels. This roadmap uh, must be able to articulate the necessary mechanisms to coordinate policies, national and regional, related to biogas, because biogas is not only an energy vector, you know, it's much more than that. So we have to be able to coordinate energy policies, environment policies, emissions, waste. We need also to coordinate circular bioeconomy <coughs> uh, policies to try to close the cycle of production processes generating bioenergy and also high added value bioproducts. To coordinate policies in the primary and secondary sectors, demographic talents to structure territories to, to achieve the rural development, just transition to open uh, investment opportunities, training and employment to try to row everyone in the same direction, to avoid possible gaps, duplication, and make the most to, to the, to the uh, public resources. Next one, please, and last one. So we strongly believe the roadmap must, must, the roadmap must analyze the enormous potential of biogas generation that Spain has from livestock, agri-food biomass, and the organic fraction of municipal solid waste. To identify the existing barriers, there are, there are many, they are strong, so we need to identify and overcome those barriers. To design the measures that will make possible the takeoff, massive implementation and consolidation of biogas in this decade, we have 10 glorious years to do it, so let's do it. And these measures, we describe them in our answer, <clears throat> must be regulatory, economic, so they have to set incentives in taxes, in grants for investment, feeding tariffs, feeding premiums, uh, for upgrading especially. They have to also invest in research, development and innovation, and this roadmap shouldn't forget the social perspective. For increasing knowledge for, env the, for the empowerment of society, it's very important everyone has enough information to make decisions. Decisions on consuming, on what they want to buy, they don't want to buy what they want to use. So, and for that, you need to inform society to increase that, then their knowledge. Also to boost self-consume, to promote energy communities, to invest in training and education, communication and dissemination activities, it will be very important. So this is the last slide from my side. This is in a nutshell what the biogas uh, situation is in Spain, the enormous possibilities for development that we have in Spain. And in case if you have any question, please, ask in the chat and I, it will be my pleasure to answer at the end of this webinar. I'll, I'll leave the floor for my colleague, Benyat. Okay, thank you very much, Margarita. So, um, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna try to give you a, 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 a quick uh, overview of the floating, of the offshore wind and in especially the floating wind uh, in Spain. Uh, as you know, there is a, um, a public consultation opened, as Margarita said, uh, and uh, we are working, uh, we've, been, we've been working to, to, to give input and, and and to propose uh, and give some proposals to the Spanish uh, government, just to develop the uh, a Spanish market on on offshore wind. So um, let's start, please. Uh, next um, slide. So as I said, I'm going to give you uh, uh, some features <coughs> and trends of the of the of the market of the. Uh, 
we, uh, offshore wind market and floating uh, wind market especially. And then uh, I'm gonna give you a, a quick uh, overview or a quick approach of the Spanish uh, situation. So uh, please next slide. So um, the, the offshore wind, as you know, is a um, very, uh, I mean, it's a consolidated market in Europe uh, and, a growing, and it's growing in other parts of the world. There are big companies doing business right now. The cost reductions has been achieved and even the forecasts have been improved. So for all these reasons, there are great expectations of growth. Uh, we're talking about uh, 450 gigawatt gigawatts in 2050, so, which is a huge amount. So um, talking on floating wind, please, next slide. So here you can see the, 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 growing, the growing market uh, since the last 10 years. And as you see, the, the, green, the green space is a floating wind, which is growing quite fast. Uh, so next, just, a, just a, some numbers to, to, to give you a, a big uh, overview. This is the, this is the, the um, friends of Europe, uh, Wind Europe, uh, which is a trade association uh, I guess you, you will know. Um, and they're talking about 450 gigawatts in 2050. So Spain, uh, as you see, Spain has uh, 13 gigawatts to be developed uh, in the next years, which is a, a very uh, huge amount and a great opportunity to to develop a Spanish market. Next slide, please. So the floating technology is achieving very, very, a very quick cost reduction, as you can see in the, in the figures. And please, next. These are some of the um, projects, uh, ongoing projects of floating wind in, in Europe. Uh, currently, there are only 40, 45 uh, megawatts of floating wind capacity operational, but there are more than 300 megawatts planned to be deployed uh, in the next uh, early years, uh, between 2020 and 2022. So, and these are some Spanish uh, solutions for floating wind, Spanish technology. There are the several several uh, solutions, several proposals, and um, all of them are Spanish uh, technologies. Um, this, uh, well, no, uh, there are some very different solutions to, to develop uh, the floating the floating the floating wind systems. So, one. Well, as, uh, please, please uh, go to the next slide. These are some um, some the first the first um, projects going on in Europe. High wind Scotland in, in, in the previous slide. This is a, a project going on in Portugal. Um, go ahead, please. So, um, why do we think Spain, Spain has to be is is well positioned and has to be a, a, an important player in this in this field. So uh, we, we we consider we have a key strength. We have very good en energetic resource and natural conditions. About uh, eight thousand kilometers of coastline. We have very good infrastructure and scientific capacities, and a great network of uh, tests. <coughs> which are very, very important to develop the, the technology. Um, this is a, a country of researchers and technologists, um, and there is a very capable industry and a complete supply chain 
to to so industrial the industrial and the industrial key is uh, important. Um, okay, this is the next. Go ahead, please go to the previous one. Can you? Okay, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Go ahead. So, um, there's a we can there's a new political momentum, and there are high expectations for ocean for no ocean and and uh, uh, offshore wind energies, um, and we are working hard uh, on, a, on a new legal framework for the next decade. Um, it's a coordinated work between the Spanish government, industrial associations, and all the stakeholders involved in this field. Um, there's a planification for the for the, for 2021-2030, a new energy planning for the new decade, and that includes uh, reasonable targets for ocean energies and some. Um, some important um, plans to develop the wind, the floating wind uh, technology in Spain. The, uh, the marine spatial planning uh, is ongoing. Is we are working on 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 in, on it uh, with the with the government, and uh, <coughs> you, you will have the the, the framework, uh, the legal framework. Uh, for the for next year, I mean, uh, around March, April will be will be finished. The Spanish, um, as I said, there are uh, very good um, researchers mm -hmm. and technologists in Spain, and these are some of their uh, solutions to to develop the floating wind uh, um, technology. I mean, go ahead, please. As I said, we have an excellent network of, of test centers and laboratories in the open sea. And uh, go ahead, indoor laboratories and tanks, which are a uh, which are key, which are a key, a key, a key thing to, to develop uh, technologies in the in the in the in the initial in the initial levels. Go ahead, please. Uh, as I said, this is a country of researchers and good technologies. They have a long-term experience and a wide know-how on ocean sciences and naval en engineering. There's a substantial national research, as I said, and technology in the innovation stage and in pre-commercial uh, pre stages um, in ocean energies and wind offshore energy. Uh, there's a huge net, a huge net of stakeholders with uh, experience, uh, experience and ambition. There's a, a very good industry and a complete uh, supply chain, scientific and technological knowledge. Go ahead. No, this is go go ahead, please. So. Um, we, uh, our key strengths, as I said, are um, a, a well-proven model for success and great know-how in renewables, industrial world-leading companies in wind energy, very good qualified technological and industrial companies completing the entire uh, supply chain. There's a Spanish naval industry, which has been a global leader, and there's a great know-how, infra good infra infrastructure, Powerful company, which are already participating in the offshore projects around the world. Besides uh, associated industry, electrical industry, metallurgic, marines, and others. Uh, industrial association at national level to defend sector, sectorial interests. Strong regional clusters focused on marine energies and there's uh, an, a growing presence in Europe and, and international forums and trade uh, associations. So, please go ahead. As I said, there's a, there's a public uh, consultant uh, opened. Spain, Spain's energy ministry is to develop a roadmap for offshore wind and is undertaking a consultation to seek view 
on its development. And the aim of the public consultation is to collect uh, our view, the view of the stakeholders, administration and companies potentially involved in this, in this sector. In our country, the water is generally too deep for conventional bottom fixed foundations. So flooding technology is expected to be crucial and for unlocking the potential of offshore wind in, in this country. Uh, as we in Europe notes recently, the Spanish leadership is likely to be strength, strengthened um, as the, as the um, Spanish, as the energy planification anticipates that renewables will be account for 42% of the country's energy mix and generate uh, 70 and will generate 74% of its electricity uh, in 2030 coming from renewables. So the government, the government plans an annual installation of 2.2 gigawatts up to 2030. We're talking about wind energy, which is huge. So Spain is now looking to take advantage on, on offshore wind and especially on floating wind. Please go ahead. Uh, and just to just to finish, uh, APA Marina, we're working uh, is the I mean is the Spanish uh, Renewable Association in the field of marine renewables, and we are working uh, we are working since 2006. We represent around 20 members, uh, and we are working on wave, tidal, and floating wind. Um, our final aim objective is uh, to create a, a Spanish market on marine energies, bringing together this, uh, and strengthen the technological and industrial companies working in this field. So we think uh, we have a, a great opportunity right now, and we have the, the, um, the appropriate stakeholders and industry capabilities, capabilities to develop a, and to, 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 to have a, an important, a, an important how to say, paper on, on, the, on, the, on the floating wind for the next uh, years. So these are our members and feel these are our members, yeah, and feel free to contact us. And uh, thank you very much. You will, you, uh, I will, I will, I will answer your your questions when we finish the the webinar. Hello, um, I think I, I'm on next. So Marianne Carlin, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Javier, uh, for the present for my presentation. And thank you to Margarita and to Benyat. Um, they've given us, you've given us a really detailed Spain, which I think will be really useful for our UK audience, for our panelists and those hearing us in the UK. Um, as you know, we have in the UK also a very strong market in both those areas. So I'm looking forward to hearing later from our, from our speakers uh, from the UK to, to hear about ways that we can, you can work together and I'm sure there'll be plenty. So before I do introduce the speakers, um, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, yeah. So I work at the Department for International Trade uh, based here at the British Embassy in Madrid. Um, we support UK companies wishing to enter the Spanish market. So to linking, them up, linking them up with Spanish partners and working together to work together in Spain and in third markets. So that's the first part of the trade. That's the trade we do. We link UK companies with partners and clients. And then we also support investment, which is looking at um, investors who, from Spain who want to set up in UK, um, either helping them establish themselves there if they haven't already, expand their business and also um, any new entrants we give them a really sort of thorough sort of uh, offer of how we can support them in the UK. Uh, apart from that um, market access we have a new department for market access helping to identify barriers for UK exporters and Spanish imports from UK to help reduce and remove them. So next slide please. 
So as I said, I'm based at the British Embassy in Madrid, where we have 17 staff, all in different sectors. I lead on the energy sector. And my colleagues in Bilbao uh, have three staff. They have an energy team there as well. And in Barcelona, six staff, also an energy team. Uh, Carolina, who will speak to you later, she uh, leads on the biogas sector, so she will introduce the, the speakers. And so we are here at your disposal if anybody needs support, either from the UK to come into Spain and make introductions to potential partners and Spanish companies um, wanting to enter the UK market in the energy sector. We have a big team, of, a network of support in the UK to do, help you do this. So you go to the next slide. And this is how we do it. This is a big team. We have sector specialists um, dealing in all parts of the energy sector. So mainly the focus is mainly renewables now. So we have um, specialists in offshore wind, in solar, in, in energy from waste, in biogas. I mean, all the areas that we are trying to promote in the UK, we have specialists in who can actually guide you through any um, opportunities that you have in that there are in the different areas, regions in the UK market. And we also work with international trade advisors who are based in all those regions. And they can also advise UK companies wanting to do business in, in other markets, in this case, Spain. We work very closely with the developed administrations, that is Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. And also we link up with the Chambers of Commerce here in Spain and in the UK to organize events, to promote any activity in our particular sectors. Our ambassador in Spain, uh, Hugh Elliott, is also a great support in the sector. He takes part in many of the activities that we, um, we hold, and so he's always there to, to lend a hand if we need it. And we also work very closely with our embassy political and economic teams, who are very close to the policy teams in the UK, and they can guide us on how policy is developing from there. So, next slide. Yeah, so really, I just wanted to give you a very, very um, snapshot, uh, short, small, short snapshot of what we do. Um, I know we've got, we haven't got that much time. We've got several speakers coming up now. So our details are here. I'm Marianne Carlin, uh, Senior Trade Investment Advisor in Madrid. That's my email. Carolina, who will be talking next, she's based in Barcelona and leads on the biogas. And Nick Greenwood is our director in the north of Spain, based in Bilbao. So any of you who are actually in those um, regions in Spain and want to contact us for support, either to identify potential UK partners or looking to enter into the UK market, please contact us. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Carolina who is going to introduce the biogas companies and then we'll move on to the floating wind. Thank you, Carolina. <clears throat> Thanks, Marianne. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, well, I, as Marianne says, I'm leading the circular economy and biogas sector in the, in the IT Spain. And I would like to introduce you uh, Sandra Sasso, the co-founder from SEAP Energy, SEAP Power, sorry. Um, SEAP has patented a groundbreaking technology which creates renewable energy, water and fertilizer from on-site or organic waste. Flexi, uh, FlexiBuster and MaxBuster uh, use um, biological use and aerobic digestion to convert organic waste into biogas. SEAP has customers in the UK, France, Portugal, and the USA in the hospitality, waste management, supermarket, and hospital sector. Uh, Sandra, the floor is yours. Unmute myself. Thank you very much, Carolina. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be here presenting our uh, small or micro anaerobic digestion system, which we are uh, bringing into the Spanish market. We actually, at uh, a, about a year ago, took investment from Enegas, um, and they are now our lead investor in the company. So we have a very big focus on the Spanish market and entry into the Spanish market. We're very pleased to see what's going on with the 
um, the new consultations and the focus on biogas. So this system is a containerized anaerobic digestion system. It's built in a factory setting and we're able to uh, take it to site and integrate it together in order to put it next to buildings or indeed in buildings in the center of the urban area. Uh, next slide, please. So the solution is scalable. Um, it allows you to adapt the systems from um, a small amount of waste, so 500 kilograms a day, all the way up to two and a half tons of waste uh, going into the system a day. Uh, our FlexiBuster system is part of the family of units that we do. We also have a MuckBuster system, which is targeted at the farm and wastewater sectors. Uh, but if I focus on the FlexiBuster, it'll give you a good idea of what we have to offer. So these systems are containerized and modular, which means that you can put them as flat modules. You can mm -hmm. scale them up or down in terms of the capacity mm -hmm. that they accommodate in terms of the waste that they're converting. And we integrate um, all the way through from pre-processing the waste on the inbound, so preparing it to be loaded into the digestion system, all the way to the very end where we can take the, ba the gas and either put it into an already integrated uh, cogen system or a CHP system, or uh, put it into a biogas boiler, or indeed convert it to uh, compressed gas or road fuel. So it's a fully integrated end-to-end -end biogas system that allows you to take on-site waste and convert it. Um, the modularity makes it financeable, so you can get uh, uh, lease financing for it, and we also can offer off-balance sheet funding for the systems into the Spanish market. Next slide, please. So the system takes in the waste in the front. Um, as the waste is loaded in the front, the uh, pre-processing module uh, kicks in, and then it, it, the bacteria inside the main digestion container will consume the bacteria, uh, consume the waste. One of the things that will come out on the uh, far end, uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, is that we're able to take the resulting fertilizer and offer it either as a liquid fertilizer or indeed as a bagged compost and a water stream for the site. So in parts of Spain where water is very precious, this might be another alternative. Uh, we've patented this, uh, this unit um, and the patents have now issued in the European Union as well as uh, the UK and uh, the USA and China and other parts of the world. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is um, just to give you an idea of some of the sites that we've done. This was one of the very first sites we did, which was an office park with a hotel and a nursery school. And it was processing 500 kilograms of food waste into energy. And the energy and water, were go the water was going back to a greenhouse operation on the site and the energy going back into a building, uh, one of the office buildings. Next slide, please. This is um, next to one of the largest hospitals in the UK, processing the food waste um, from the hospital and returning the energy value to the building in the form of electricity. Next slide, please. This is behind a supermarket in Portugal, uh, processing the food waste coming from the, the Portuguese supermarket, giving uh, them back a liquid fertilizer, which the intention is to bottle and put on the shelves. Thank you, next slide, please. And finally, in France, we have another example, which is a waste processing site where they were doing a small collection round from local restaurants. And uh, the, uh, they were doing a um, interim waste step where they were separate, separating out the organic fraction. Um, and before they were having to pay and move it one more step. In this case, now they don't move that next step to the final location uh, for the uh, larger AD, but they keep the unit, the, the waste on site and process it into electricity and then put the resulting uh, mulch that they, they uh, generate onto their composting, onto their commercial composting facility oh, yeah. and uh, complete the circle that way. Okay. So again, another point of circular economy. Next slide, please. This is showing in, in a building, in a university setting, um, again, processing, uh, this is, happens to be in the United States, uh, processing 500 kilograms of the university campus waste. It's actually integrated into some R&D work that they're doing around algae and producing fuel from algae. Next slide, please. 
So these are the types of uh, customers that we work with around the world. Um, and we'd be very happy to work with some more customers in Spain. Um, we're looking for our first sites and we have the funding to be able to support uh, deployment on, on a free basis to uh, customers that have the suitable profile and are looking for a uh, serviced offering. Um, we will support that. We work with large facilities management companies around the world uh, like NG and Veolia and Sodexo and um, they can support those installations locally um, in the local market. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and these are just, we're, we're based in London. Uh, we manufacture in Portugal, in the UK, and in the United States. And um, we have a new operations starting, um, well, we, they, were, they were due to start before COVID in the United States. So um, very shortly, uh, once we're able to travel again. Uh, next slide, please. So thank you very much for um, listening. If you have any questions or you would like to partner with us or you have a site that would be suitable, please, please get in touch. Uh, we'd be very happy to work with you on any issues that you have for the consultation and to be able to participate in um, getting the regulatory framework uh, in Spain to allow for the positioning of these small micro plants on, on sites so that we can reduce the amount of travel that the waste is doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Super interesting, your presentation. Um, well, the next speaker in the UK, currently uh, there are around 700 digestion plants. Uh, 100 biomethane to grid plants. For me, it's a pleasure now to introduce you, uh, Nicolas Hoquet, sales manager at Green Lane Biogas. Green Lane Biogas is the world's largest biogas upgrading company, pioneer developer and leader in water wash biogas upgrading technology with over 100 global installations. Green Lane is well positioned as, the, as they are able to provide the three primary biogas upgrade technologies, water wash, membrane, and PSA. So Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for your attention. I just represent. I just present you my company in a few in a few words. Uh, so I'm uh, French. I'm located in France, but uh, the European headquarter of the company is located in uh, UK in uh, Sheffield. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, next, I'm sorry that uh, we have to to click uh, several. Yes. So Glenane Biogas is old company created in uh, 1986 in New Zealand. We have more than uh, 30 years of experience. Since June of last year, uh, we become Greenland Renewables. It's a company on the stock exchange in uh, Toronto, in Canada. Next, please. And uh, Greenland Biogas is uh, it is a Greenland Renewable subsidiary. Next, please. Today, we are around more or less 40 people into the world. Uh, we have local partner for maintenance installation sales. We have a partner in Spain, a partner in Italy, a partner in France. Uh, uh, we have our team in the UK. And uh, as I said previously, in Sheffield in UK, we, are, we have the, the, the European aid office, which name is Greenland Biogas Limited. We have a workshop and the maintenance team. Yes, okay. Next one, please. Just to, to give you a few information about the company, we are the leader in terms of uh, installed capacity of upgrading in the world. Uh, it is more than uh, 115,000 normal cubic meters per hour of biogas installed. We delivered more than 100 installations, more or less it's 110 uh, today. Uh, we are present in, uh, sorry, we, we sold units in 18 countries and in 11 countries, we sold the first uh, upgrading unit of the country. For instance, our, fir uh, our first installation was in France in 1986. It was uh, more than uh, uh, 50 years. The, the plant doesn't more exist, but it was our first plant. 
we provide the, the, the biggest plant in the world, uh, the biggest upgrading plant in the world. It is in Quebec, in Canada, in the French Canada, in Montreal. It's uh, 16,000 uh, normal cubic meters per, per hour of biogas. As I said, we have more than 30 years experience and our activity is only uh, upgrading. We are not a plant provider. We are only working uh, on upgrading uh, biogas. And we are the only company able to, to propose the free main technology to upgrade the biogas. Next one, please. Hello. Uh, just to give you, uh, to, to, uh, to remember you, uh, there's uh, two uh, main sources of biogas. The first source is the digester, it's ID plant. And the other source is landfill. The landfill, uh, when you put some waste, produce biogas. And the biogas, uh, for the biogas, there's two possibilities to use it. You can use directly the biogas in CHP. Uh, to produce both electricity and heat. And you can upgrade the biogas to uh, biomethane. RNG, it's a renewable natural gas, is biomethane. This biomethane could be directly injected into the grid and pipeline, or it could be compressed or liquefied to, to be used as, as a fuel for vehicles. CNG, it's more for cars, and LNG, it's more for trucks and uh, ships. Next one, please. So uh, Greenland uh, Biogas is about to provide the free main technology, water wash, uh, PSA, or membrane. It will depend on the quality of the biogas and uh, the quality of the expected uh, biomethane. Uh, next one, please. Alors, in function of the, as I explained, in function of the quality of the gas and uh, in function of the origin of the biogas, and the quality expected of biomethane, we will choose PSA, membrane, or water wash. Next one, please. Uh, next, sorry, it's not... <laughs> again. We can also propose combination of several <coughs> technology, excuse me. We can also propose some pre-treatment technology, especially for PSA for membrane upgrading technology. Next one, please. This technology is uh, set up to remove h 2 s VOC, and Celexan. Uh, this uh, free kind of pollutant cannot be removed by the upgrading uh, unit by itself. Uh, the treatment could be made by activated carbon, by chemical scrubbing, by iron oxide, by uh, biological system, etc. We can also propose treatment from off gas. The off gas is, how uh, to say, uh, the input of the into the machine. The input is biogas. The outlet is biomethane plus of gas. The of gas mainly is uh, it's CO2. So we can propose some system to remove also H2S in, uh, in uh, of gas, uh, VOC, siloxane, especially for water wash and for PSA. RTO, it's a, it's a system of uh, thermal oxidation of the of, the, uh, of, the of gas. Eflux is a kind of thermal system to, pre to treat the of gas. We can propose chemical scrubbing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And into the of gas, we can also propose a system to recover the CO2. It's possible with the the membrane technology and with the PSA technology. Next one, please. You can also propose some post treatment for the biomethane. Uh, for instance, if you have very uh, strict specification into the grid, uh, you can add some system to polish the biomethane. It's kind of more or less this kind of PSA. Next one, please. So the, 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 the goal of this additional equipment is to remove the, the N2 and the O2 into the biomethane to reach some very low content. As I explained, it's polisher. Next one, please. It could be a deox. Deox is more, uh, mainly for, to remove the oxygen, etc. Uh, the free, I will pass uh, quickly on the free main technology. Next one, please. The, the first technology is the more uh, used in the world until now, it's the water wash technology. Uh, next one, please. Uh, it's a very simple system. Next one. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know. I will have to ask uh, next one each time. The, the methane recovery is very high, it's 99%. 
it means that if you are if you have a 100 molecule of CH4 into the biogas, you will recover into the biomethane now it's in our uh, molecule of CH4. We don't need any pretreatment for the water wash. All the HOS, VOC, siloxane are managed by the system. The capex is slow, <coughs> especially for big machine, and the opex are very slow, compared very low compared to membrane or other system, because there's a few electrical consumption and a, a few amount of consumable. Next one, please. Next, it's uh, just just a small drawing to explain you the system. There's two colon. The first colon is a scrubber, scrubber colon, scrubber vessel. In the in the bottom, we have a boiler. We push the compressor. Sorry, we push a nine bar pressure the 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 biogas throughout the colon from the bottom to the up of the colon, and uh, there's some water like a shower which falls from the, the the top of the colon to the bottom to the bottom of the colon, and the CO2 content into the biogas uh, under pressure at the low temperature, low temperature means around the five or seven degrees Celsius. Uh, the water will catch the CO2 and the, the, the VOC and the siloxane. And in the top of the colon, uh, the outlet is the biomethane. But the system a TSL dryer to dry the, the biomethane and the biomethane, biomethane is ready to be injected to the grid or to be compressed or to, to be uh, to be liquefied later. After we have the second colon, it's a flashing vessel because into the water, a small part of the CH, uh, CH4 could, be, uh, could go in solution into the water. So we decrease the pressure from nine bar into the, the previous column to uh, six or five bar. So all the methane uh, content into the water uh, goes into the into the to say the, the, the as a gas with a part of the CO2 and there's a recycling from this gas into the, the inlet of the system. And after in the, the following column, it's a kind of uh, stripping and we can uh, wash the water. You inject some air and the air will clean the water and you can reuse the water. I don't know if I am clear, excuse me, because normally I show with my finger the, 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 the to say, the, the, the way of the gas, but it's not possible here. Next one, please. Next. So I, as I explained, the, 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 CH, the CH4 recovery rate is very high. Uh, we can accept high level of H2S. There's no, uh, you don't need any pretreatment and the specific consumption are very low. Next one, please. Uh, over possibility of a technology, the PSA. The PSA, I, 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 will, I will go more quick, excuse me, more quickly. The PSA, it's a system very uh, well uh, suitable, uh, suitable for very uh, bad gas, very bad biogas. It means gas with lots of O2 or lots of N2. Uh, for instance, it's gas from landfill. Next one, please. Next one. And it's very, uh, it's very uh, interesting for in case where the biomethane are, um, has to respect very strict uh, specification. For instance, we have a project in California and we use PSA to, to be able to reach the quality expected of the biomethane. Next one, please. Uh, just uh, just uh, uh, quickly, uh, we have to, to pre-treat the biogas to remove uh, H2S, VOC, etc. We have colon or activated carbon. After, we have system to compress the gas and the, and the gas go through the PSA by itself. There's RNG at the outlet and off gas uh, as for the, the, the water wash. Next one, please. Next one, please. Okay. Uh, next, next. Uh, I just explained the system. The system into the column, you have some uh, absorbent media, and the, in the absorbent media, there's some pore, and the, the, the size of the pore fit or not with the size of the molecule. Next one, please. Ne next one. Next. As you can see, uh, the, the, the size of the CH4 molecule doesn't fit with the size of the, of the pore of the adsorbent media. 
So all the CH4 pass through the media, but a part of the, oxy of the, part of the oxygen and a part of the nitrogen are catched by the media. And all the CO2 is catched by, by, the, by the media. So if you want to catch a maximum of uh, N2 and O2, you can play on the pressure, on the retention uh, into the column, etc. But uh, just to show that the technology is very good for gas containing uh, CO2 and N2. Next one, please. As I explained, it's very good for uh, gas with high content on nitrogen and N2. 18% uh, of nitrogen is very high. Normally, in the gas from uh, digester, the content of nitrogen is more or less 1%. But for landfill, we can have very uh, gas with uh, uh, really uh, rich in uh, N2. We can provide system with one or two stage, and we can recover the CO2 in the of gas uh, if, it, it, if it is necessary. Next one, please. Uh, I will pass uh, quickly. Next, please. The, the last technology we propose is the membrane. It's a new West technology. It's uh, quite cheap. It's very easy to understand. And then, uh, the, this technology can remove uh, the CO2 a part of the O2, but not nitrogen. It means that if we have landfill gas, normally this kind of technology cannot be used uh, to treat biogas uh, from landfill, but it's perfect for uh, biogas from AD plant. Next one, please. Well, the system, uh, more or less, is the same design, that same layout of that for uh, PSA. We have a first type of H2S reduction with active carbon. What a compression system? We have to we have to uh, cool the gas. Uh, we have to to catch the water. Uh, we can add uh, another carbon, active carbon, if necessary, for VOC and siloxane. And after we the we send the gas into the the membrane system. The membrane you need normally is made with three stage: stage one, stage two, and stage three. But uh, make it simple. So at, at the outlet, it's uh, LNG, and the exhaust is uh, of gas. And with the, with the of gas, we can recover the CO2 with a special system, with an additional system. Next one, please. Uh, sorry, Nicholas. Yeah. Sorry, we've got one minute left. Yeah, okay. So I pass. I, I stop to explain you the, the different technology. Uh, the membrane is like kind of filter. Next one, please. Uh, next one. Next one. Next one, so uh, I don't have, sorry, I don't have time. Next one, and next one, next one, so it's too long. Next one, next one. Just, just a thing, uh, I just want to explain you that we have a financial partner, so Greenland is able to sell some uh, upgrading unit to customer or to propose a kind, uh, to propose to sell a service. It's a kind of rental. It means that uh, the customer don't have to loan money to the bank to buy the machine. Uh, we take it, we, we, we install the machine, we ensure the maintenance, and we give some warranty on uh, 15 or 20 years, performance warranty, uh, efficiency warranty, etc. And the customer just have to pay a monthly fee. Other possibility, a partner is able to invest in the whole project it means including into the digester. So it means if you have a, a biogas project with, bio, uh, with the variation of the biogas into biomethane, we can propose you uh, a, a partner to invest in a project if necessary. Next one, please. Next one is this. so. Uh, excuse me for the Spanish for the Spanish market. So we can propose you. Uh, technical solutions for the, for the upgrading, financial solution, and we are interested to work with local supplier, for instance, to, to buy some device, metal rods, consumable, etc. Uh, if local supplier can propose post or pre-treatment system, we can discuss with them, it can be interesting. And uh, we are also looking for partner for liquefaction, virtual pipe, etc. We are open to discuss with any uh, actor into the biogas and uh, biomethane sector. Okay, Nika, I'm sorry. sorry. We have I'm to sorry. It was, because... I was too late. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Excuse me. We need to go on to the next speaker, otherwise we're going to run out of time. Um, Karen, thank you, you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much, Nicolas, for your presentation. It's uh, a pleasure to have you on board. 
And now it's time to introduce you uh, Troy Keenan, Business Development Associate at Camblin. The Camblin Photonics Division has developed a biogas monitoring solution called Biospec. The solution provides an effective uh, means to measure biogas for industrial biogas plants with upgrading facilities. It operates, it operates using optical technology and Troy, the floor is yours. Troy, you are on mute. Thanks, Carolina. Uh, thank you to APA and DIT for having me present today. I am, as Carolina said, I'm Troy Keenan. I work in business development at Camlin Biogas. And today uh, we'll just look at Camlin's involvement in biogas, uh, particularly in the monitoring of volatile organic compounds, VOCs, which I believe um, in Spanish is uh, CO fees or compuestos organicos volatiles. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, just to explain a bit about who Camlin are. Uh, so in simple terms, we, we work with global electricity, gas and rail infrastructures to provide um, cutting edge technologies and solutions. So our, our target is to help the customers uh, to uh, con connect data from our instruments um, to the knowledge that they need to make the appropriate decisions and improve their operations. Uh, so by providing these data, um, these data driven insights, we, we help our customers basically to keep the lights on, keep the gas flowing and to keep the passengers moving all in these critical infrastructure sectors. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, Kamen have quite a global reach. So we have facilities in 21 cities across 17 different countries with our headquarters being in Northern Ireland in the UK. And next slide. We also have a global customer portfolio and you might recognize some of the companies here. Uh, so our, our core mission as a business is to work in partnership with our customers to develop solutions that um, that are going to drive their success in delivering tomorrow's smart energy infrastructure and transportation networks. Uh, so now on to the, the, uh, the topic of today's presentation. So today uh, we're going to first look at the problem that VOCs bring in biogas upgrading and then the importance of monitoring them. And then I'm going to talk a bit about a real world um, some real customer data that we've collected with the device. Next slide. So let's um, just begin at looking at the source of VOCs. So um, as, you, as you probably know, the biogas industry is significantly growing worldwide uh, with many countries placing net zero carbon emissions uh, targets. So the key of biogas reaching this target is to unlock the potential of all waste streams. But with more diversified waste streams um, brings a more unpredictable composition of biogas. For example, some common VOCs that we see in biogas are P-simine that comes from vegetables such as carrots and some fruits. Uh, we also have D-limonene that comes from citrus fruits and is, and is also used in household products, household cleaning products to make that nice lemon scent. And the list goes on with pinenes from garden waste, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and other contaminants. So due to the diverse, uh, diversified feedstock digestion, many plants are having um, this problem of VOCs nowadays. Next slide. Uh, here's just one example of how a biogas upgrading uh, plant could look. Um, so we see here that there are activated carbon filters after the anaerobic digestion process 
This is to remove the impurities such as the H2S and VOCs um, before the biogas passes on to the uh, CO2 removal stage. Next slide. Uh, so Camlin have developed a monitoring solution to overcome the problems with VOCs. So um, this, this image on screen shows where our device fits into the facility. It's able to monitor VOCs before, uh, in between and after the filters to ensure that the impurities are effectively being removed from the biogas. Next slide, please. So if we, if we don't monitor these VOCs, it can lead to an increased spend on activated carbon filters due to replacing the filters too early. Um, also, if the VOCs are not properly removed by the filters, damage can be caused to the, uh, to the expensive upgrading uh, equipment. And lastly, it's essential to, uh, it's essential that biomethane that's being um, injected onto the gas grid meets uh, very strict specifications. Uh, as if there are too many contaminants in the gas, it can result in non-compliance and in the risk of the plant being shut down for a period of time. Next slide, please. So um, here is an example of data that we have uh, taken with our Biospec VOC device. At uh, This is at a plant in Northern Europe, and this data is over a period of three months. So uh, we're presenting here just a couple of the gases measured by the analyzer, uh, and this is before the activated carbon filters. So the feedstock of this plant is 100% food waste. And we're looking here at some of the terpenes, uh, p-symine and d-limonene, uh, which are two of the most common terpenes in, in biogas uh, that we can also see here are in the tens to hundreds of parts per million levels. Uh, and also uh, two butanone, which uh, we can see here in white, is one of the ketone molecules, uh, uh, which is also presented here at 50, at 50 parts per million. So the levels of these do change over the year, depending on the mix of feedstock going into the digester. However, this gives us an idea of the level of contaminants that can be found in the raw biogas. And next slide, please. So uh, here we're now looking at the data from the same three month period, but uh, showing the concentration of the VOCs in the gas after the activated carbon filters. Uh, we can see that for the majority of the time, the concentration of the VOCs is zero, um, as we would expect. However, at a certain point in time, we see that the 2-butanone compound is starting to rise rapidly, uh, which lets us know that the activated carbon filter is reaching its saturation point. Uh, 2-butanone is one of the smaller uh, ketone molecules that's in the gas. Uh, so this sh shows us that different molecules can break through the filters at different rates, uh, as the larger molecules p-symine and d-limonene are, are not yet breaking through. Uh, you may notice that when compared to the previous graph, the 2-butanone levels are higher after the activated carbon filters than in the raw biogas. Uh, this is because the terpene molecules are replacing the ketone molecules in the activated carbon and effectively forcing out the ketone molecules. So we can see a spike in ketones at the point when the activated carbon filters are being saturated. Uh, then, then we can see that after the filters uh, were replaced, the values dropped back to zero for a number of days before they started to rise again. Um, and this biomethane plant uh, uh, used in this information, uh, was able to use this information to effectively uh, replace their filters and prevent the VOCs from leaking through and damaging the membrane upgrading process. Um, and they were also able to select the most appropriate type of filters needed for the feedstock being digested by, by having this information. And next slide, please. 
So uh, Camlin uses a technique called optical spectroscopy to measure the, the VOCs. So our device, the, the BioSpec VOC, uh, measures a range of gases in a single measurement, uh, including all of the terpenes, ketones, silenes, and other gases uh, that are shown here. Next slide, please. So this, uh, this is a, a new VOC measurement method, um, uh, which brings with it many, many benefits, such as uh, it doesn't require any carrier gas or recalibration. Um, it's simple to operate, so you don't need any uh, expertise. Um, and it's, it's, quite, it's very cost effective with accuracy uh, that's fully suitable for uh, VOC monitoring in biogas upgrading or biomethane plants. Um, it also brings a range of benefits to the biomethane plant as it helps to reduce the operating expenditure, uh, maximize the uptime of the plant, and is also low maintenance and can be, it can also be easily integrated and installed in new or existing plants. Next slide, please. Uh, so that, that sums it up from me today. Um, I just also like to mention that the, the data presented uh, that I talked about today in this case study was from a collaboration with a biogas upgrading company who were seeking new ways to better optimize their plant. Uh, and we're also working on a number of other uh, collaborative uh, innovative projects for other parts of the biogas plant from the AV plant itself as well as the gas grids um, in the bio, that the biomethane is injected to. So we welcome new uh, collaborations. So um, you can uh, contact me if you, uh, to, at the email address on screen here, t.keenan at camlingroup.com if you'd like to discuss um, anything else. So uh, thank you very much and I'll hand on to the next, next session. Thank you very much, Troy. Uh, super comprehensive, your presentation, and very, very interesting. Marianne, I hand over to you, and then you can introduce the, the wind sector. I think that you are on mute, Marianne. Marianne, you're still on mute. Okay, sorry, that's, uh, I'm all right now, I guess. Um, yes, thank you very much to the biogas speakers. Moving on swiftly to floating offshore wind. Just uh, very quickly, um, as you know, the UK is the largest offshore, has the largest offshore wind industry in the world right now. Um, we have an ambition for 40 gigawatts for 2030. And um, within that, uh, the UK is likely to require a minimum of 20 gigawatts by 2050 of floating wind uh, to achieve our net zero targets. So a uh, very big industry in the UK. Hopefully we'll be able to support the Spanish industry, which is growing also in, in Spain. And so over to our first speaker, who is uh, Bruce Volpe from BVG Associates. Uh, BVG uh, provides strategic consulting for the renewable energy sector, focusing on marine and wind. They've been working with UK government on, on roadmaps, or well, the UK government and other governments uh, around the world on different roadmaps and advising um, in policy, cost reduction studies, etc. So real experience in this area. Um, so over to you, Bruce, if you can just uh, give a presentation of what you actually do and how you can enter the market, how you're hoping to enter the Spanish market. Thanks, Marianne, and good afternoon, everybody. There we go. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so we're a... Uh, a business economics and um, technology strategy uh, consultancy active globally. I think what differentiates us uh, is that we are highly focused uh, on the wind industry, so have huge experience in, in, in that area. Next slide. Just as some examples of um, current uh, and recent projects, um, 
Ben Ah mentioned earlier uh, uh, 450 gigawatts roadmap for uh, offshore wind in Europe up to 2050. We wrote that with, with Wind Europe last year uh, and uh, are working on global visions for, uh, for offshore wind uh, at the moment and then specific studies in a range of different countries uh, to help them find the best way forward balancing cost reduction and local job creation. Uh, which are often the two the two challenges uh, to to uh, to balance in a um, in, in a market. We also work uh, a lot with uh, private companies, helping them to be successful uh, in the in the wind industry. Next slide. So people often uh, ask us, um, how will the floating uh, offshore wind industry progress? We expect it to progress relatively similarly to the standard uh, bottom fixed uh, offshore wind industry, how that progressed over the last 15 years or so, uh, but a fair bit faster. So there's a sort of a pattern that we'd expect of, of single prototype turbines, uh, demonstration projects, then moving on to early commercial projects before, before moving on to full commercial projects at sort of 500 megawatt scale and, and, and greater. A lot of that activity is not really to prove the turbines themselves. The turbines that will be used in, in floating offshore wind projects will be pretty similar to, to those uh, that are used in, in standard offshore wind projects. So it's mainly around the foundations, the, uh, um, the anchoring systems, the installation processes, the operation and maintenance processes uh, and, and the like. Those are the things that will need to be proven. And, and the speed of this, this journey um, that, that, that we show uh, really is, is dictated by a combination of the technology readiness. So a lot of technology can be used from other sectors, but it has to be repurposed for, for offshore wind. Uh, and to get the costs right, the, there needs to be a fair bit of innovation uh, in the technology. Uh, then there's the growth of the supply chain to get to the volumes needed uh, to, um, to, 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 to deliver. Uh, and then um, there are the, there's the sort of market framework. So from, from a standing start, a country that has no offshore wind, it's going to take seven to 10 years before there's much volume installed just because of all of the frameworks that are needed to establish a, um, an infrastructure industry. So we anticipate around, uh, sorry, not yet, not yet. <laughs> we, we anticipate around six or seven gigawatts of, of floating offshore wind installed uh, globally by uh, the end of uh, uh, sort of, yeah, head, heading, for, heading for 2030, um, which is about 500 turbines worth of, of sort of 12 to 14 megawatts uh, scale turbines, which will be the average uh, for the market over the period from now until then. Uh, now you can go to the next slide. Uh, thank you. So the key early markets will be uh, places like France, Japan, UK and US, partly because these places already have frameworks uh, for offshore wind in place, plus then have uh, some deep water locations and, and good wind resources in those places. But there are other, many other places um, globally where there are deep water, good wind resource and population centers um, relatively close um, to, the, to the coast. So by 2050, we expect uh, offshore, floating offshore wind could, could well, um, uh, maybe in 2050, there'll be as much floating offshore wind being installed uh, as, as bottom fixed. Uh, it really can open up the market and, and grow the market globally uh, significantly compared with the places that are um, just shallow water. I mean, I'm talking shallow waters, the, the traditional technology can work in, in water depths up to about 50 meters, maybe 60 meters. Beyond that, you're looking at floating projects. So uh, next slide. So um, this is, uh, this is our, our view, maybe my view of, of the future cost of energy from um, floating and bottom fixed um, offshore wind. We do a lot of modeling in this sort of space and have a lot of industry engagement. So we can break down these very headline figures into all sorts of levels of depth um, if, if, if you'd like to go there. Uh, the dark blue curve uh, here is the, um, the cost of energy for um, bottom fixed projects in mature markets. Um, 
uh, globally. Uh, so mainly in, in, in Europe at the, uh, at the moment. And the, the band that you can see around the dark blue line is the variation uh, due to um, the range of site conditions that you expect um, in, in, uh, in, in, in different places. So windy sites or deep water sites or whatever have, have effects on the, on, the, on, the, on the cost of energy. So that, that band includes the, 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 the site variations as well as um, variations due to um, frameworks in countries, levels of risk, uh, ways of doing auctions and, and, and the like. The light blue band that we show there is our, our best guess at, uh, at the, the um, cost of energy from floating uh, offshore wind. Um, and the band in this case is just doesn't include any variation in the different site, uh, sort of DNA of different sites. It's, it's about the commercial and technical uh, uncertainty uh, in, 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 in the space at the moment. And you'll see that uh, even in the 2020s, there's, there's already quite an overlap of those bands. There will be places where floating offshore wind will be cheaper uh, than, 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 than bottom fixed offshore wind. And by something like 2035, the gap will be, uh, um, could be pretty negligible uh, between, the, uh, between the two um, technologies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, last slide uh, and, and a bit of a thought leader um, <coughs> from us. What we've done here is combine the, um, the market forecast data that I showed with the, um, the cost of energy curve that I showed to uh, look at the, um, the cost gap between, offshore, uh, between traditional and, and floating offshore wind. So the red line here is the cumulative additional lifetime cost of floating projects uh, over bottom fixed projects um, for the uh, for the uh, for projects with first operation in the in, in the given year and what that's showing is that uh, it'll cost about 15 to 20 billion euros globally to get off to get floating offshore wind uh, fully commercial compared to um, bottom fixed um, offshore wind, and most of that spend uh, will have been committed by uh, around 2035. So uh, a bit more on the red, the uh, th some of that spend will be in R and D, uh, and but the bulk of that spend will be on on projects closing the financial gap between. Uh, bottom fixed projects and, uh, and, and, and floating projects. And I think for us, the headline is that that, that cost is actually relatively small. Um, the, uh, the UK government and other governments leading the way in, in, in traditional offshore wind has, will have spent a lot more than that by the time um, they've paid all of the subsidies and the like um, for all the projects that are, that are in operation now. So, um, it's good value for the world to, uh, to, to, to get floating offshore wind um, fully commercialized. Uh, at, but still, there is a cost to pay. And it's likely that that cost will be shared between consumers uh, and, the, uh, and the wind industry. But that's still got to be worked through. And we think that for countries that go relatively early on uh, floating offshore wind, then those countries also have an opportunity to be rewarded by a bigger um, fraction of the global supply chain uh, for, uh, for, for floating offshore wind. So there's some uh, headlines from us, uh, hopefully made up a little bit of lost time. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, yes, I think you have, and I really appreciate it. Um, and also thanks for that, uh, because I think your experience and, and expertise in the sector is going to be very valuable to the Spanish sector as well as they develop. So uh, definitely uh, hope we'll can put you in touch with um, some companies who will be able to use your services there. Okay, so let's go, let's, uh, go to Atkins now. Atkins uh, provides, is, is a very big, uh, well-known consultancy provides engineering design and project management uh, services to around across the energy um, sector, oil and gas, renewables, nuclear <coughs> and conventional. They have been involved and their partners in the King Cardin uh, project in Scotland uh, with uh, ACS Cobra and also involved in the high wind and, uh, yeah, and the wind flow um, project in Portugal. 
So um, also a lot of experience there. So over to you, Chris. Lovely. Thanks very much. And it's a pleasure to speak with you all today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Chris Cowan. I'm the Offshore Wind Market Director for SNC Lavalin Atkins. Um, I'm based in the UK, um, but my role uh, is global. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, before we touch on floating wind, I'll give you a very quick overview of Atkins, what we do in offshore wind as a whole. Appreciate I only have 10 minutes. So I'll keep this, uh, this part very short. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, Atkins is part of the SSC Lavalin Group, having been acquired in 2017. And, and as mentioned, we're one of Europe's largest engineering consultancies, with over 75 years of experience in the delivery of major industrial projects. And we have a combined workforce of about 50,000 strong worldwide across uh, 50 countries. So we offer a unique global service in integrated planning, design, engineering, um, and project management with particular focus on projects in energy, transportation, and, and, and infrastructure sectors. Atkins has about 45 years offshore engineering experience, driven very much by the hydrocarbon market, um, and more recently, the renewable energy uh, market. Our experience ranges from design, so concept and detail, right way through to integrity management, safety and reliability um, assessments. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so Atkins has a long history, as I mentioned, in, in offshore engineering, um, spanning 55 years or more. This has allowed us to transition into offshore wind seamlessly, whereby over the last 15 years, we've been involved with 56 offshore wind farms and over eight gigawatts of electricity depends on our installed structures. So during this time, we fully designed and installed about 19 offshore substation platforms um, in excess of 375 fixed foundations, of which about 58% are jackets um, and the rest are monopiles. And we've worked on about 11 floating offshore wind projects, which have included semi-subs, tension platforms, spars, etc., for projects such as Denry Trike in Cardin, uh, wind float and high wind, for, for etc., which I'll, I'll cover in a little bit more detail um, shortly. Um, for the last 15 years, we've been at the forefront of the industry with an initial focus um, in the UK. But as this industry matures and expands globally, we've had to as well. So we're now operational um, across the globe, working in China, France, Germany, uh, Holland, South Korea, Japan, and USA, to, to, um, to name a few. Um, so next slide, please. So Atkins is so looking now at sort of floating wind. So Atkins is now arguably the most experienced design engineering consultant company in offshore floating wind through our work on numerous projects, um, as mentioned, on Dunray Trunk and Cardin, for example, et cetera, um, both in the UK um, and in the US. And our roles as, as engineers and designers um, for wind farms on wind floats, um, the demonstrator in Portugal um, and other variants in Japan in, in the USA. Uh, to date, the development of offshore wind has focused on shallow water coastal areas, uh, typically up to about 60 meter water depth, um, with the industry focusing on traditional fixed bottom structures such as monopiles and jackets. Uh, the growth of offshore wind into deeper water is being driven very much by the lure of higher and more consistent wind speeds, which is expanding the offshore wind market into, the, into um, developing floating technology. Um, and as the LCOE has tumbled for fixed bottom structures in Europe, and we're now seeing emerging uh, global offshore wind markets um, in Asia and in the US. And these markets are not only targeting fixed bottom, but they've also um, got the presence of deep water, which is in turn helping develop floating wind technology as well. Um, so the next few slides look at floating wind in a little bit more detail. Um, so over the last 10 years, um, the floating, so sorry, we have about 10 years of floating wind um, design experience built upon decades of experience um, of design and analysis of deep water um, floating oil and gas platforms and our portfolio of oil and gas design project includes about 75 percent of the world's deep water uh, tension lake platforms as well as spars and submersibles um, so very much a, a, an important sort of track record there to sort of drive into into the offshore wind floating sectors as we move forward and next slide please so why choose floating wind well every geographic region has its own uh, needs uh, today UK Europe is focused on shallow water fixed foundation solutions um, but as these sites get developed moving further offshore becomes inevitable 80% uh, of UK's offshore wind resources in waters deeper than about 60 meters water depth um, and at this sort of water depth the viability of fixed versus floating um, is, is questionable 
Compared to fixed offshore wind, a significant benefit for floating wind is the ability to standardize the platforms um, across the wind farm and driving down costs by the very nature of mass production. Floating wind is completely scalable and tr transferable skills from fabrication yards and modular assembly moving forward is essential. Leveraging shore side assembly and large resource base reduces a number of limitations that fixed offshore wind is exposed to, uh, such as uh, installation vessel limitations. WTG side is likely to continue to grow in the short term, um, but due to the limitations in, in installation vessels and also technology, it is expected that their size will reach a limit of around 50 megawatts actually this year. And in fact, we've already seen this week, I don't know if you've read the announcement, um, but the SOFIA project um, is about to use 14 um, megawatt turbines, which is a significant step forward for the industry. Uh, the key constraint here is the limited availability of installation vessels that are capable of operating in deep water, so beyond the sort of 60, 70 meter water depths that have su su uh, sufficient lift weight and height capacity to perform the installation and major component change out. So floating wind has a potential to remove these constraints as it leverages key side assembly. There are some challenges, however, that need to be addressed for floating wind, such as investment in port facilities to cater for construction and storage of parts, parts assembly of the units at the, at the shore side and the modular designs that um, the offshore wind, the floating aspect of offshore wind requires. Next slide, please. So all of the different types of floating um, options, um, well, there's, there's numerous uh, out there. Um, there are many systems to choose from, such as spars, uh, semi-subs, tension leg platforms, etc. They all have merits and disadvantages and need to be considered based on the site characteristics, such as the water depth, your met ocean conditions, what your wave period, um, seabed conditions, so what's your mooring type, you know, logistics, what, where, how can it be fabricated and, and installed. And there are other factors too that resonate into the engineering, um, um, and in, in, into the engineering aspects that you need to consider such as stability. So where's the stability provided? Is it buoyancy aids? Is it water plane? Or is it more intention? Hydrodynamics, so movement created by the Met Ocean, structural, what sort of buoyancy system platforms required? Are there other technologies that are going to be used on the, on the platform? Uh, fabrication installation is the fabrication complex. And remember, if efficiency and cost reduction come from mass production, so simple fabrication will pay dividends. Um, can it be assembled at Quayside or was it a separate installation and so on and so forth? And then you've got your mooring system, tension, continuary, heat taut, O and M, will it be maintained site or towed back to port? So there's lots of things to consider um, for, the, for the floating sort of aspect. Um, as what we have seen in the industry though, um, you know, the monopiles, if you go back uh, only just a few years, you know, the water depths that monopiles um, can be installed in have you know, jumped forward rapidly. We're now putting monopiles in 40 plus meter water depths. Um, jackets, um, 50 meter water depths is not unheard of for, for offshore wind. But there is, a, there is a tipping point as to when jackets and, and monopiles and floating wind become sort of, um, or, or the scales tip. Um, and, you know, with semi-subs, you know, 40 plus meter water depths, you could get a semi-sub in there just about. Um, and floating sort of for the TLPs and spars, you need slightly more deeper water depths of sort of 100 meter plus sort of range. So, um, the market is ever, ever evolving, but it's just like a bit of a, bit of a cost benefit analysis on, on all of that. So the next slide, please. Um, so Atkins capability within um, floating wind turbines ex extends right from the project inception through to design, fabrication into the service integrity. Um, our experience resides in design services, so concept feed and detail design of the complete WTG. Uh, structure, mooring design, dynamic cable and grid connection. We do owners engineer services, um, including supplying staff to perform key package manager roles within plant teams, early concept development and site selection studies, consenting support and supporting to the wider industry in developing energy policy regulation and codes and standards suitable for the growth of floating wind markets as it sort of evolves around the globe. So a few projects here just to mention, wind float that's been talked about once or twice, um, by a couple of the other presenters. So Atkins completed the structural and the marine system pre-feed, feed and detail design and the fabrication support for the two megawatt wind float type one prototype, which is located in Portugal um, on behalf of Principal Power. And since then we've been sort of um, uh, pivotal in, in upscaling that technology for six and eight megawatt versions uh, for several locations around the globe. King Carden two has been mentioned. Uh, we've conducted the feed for the King Carden semi 
semi spa it was a concrete floating turbine um the largest uh capacity floating moon farm consented at that time uh, in fact we were we were one of the um co-developers there on that um high wind installation challenge and atkins won the statal innovation challenge to produce um technology for enhancing the efficiency of the transportation installation of high wind spars so that was um that was really about how you get the the spa boys um out to site fully kitted up because as i mentioned the spas take a lot of water depth bringing them to quayside is a challenge so the frame that we produced allowed the spa boys to come to the quayside kit them out and then you towed them out as a group of four um out to site so yeah it was um it was a, a, a quite an interesting study, that one. And the last one there that I'll just talk about is the Dunray Tri uh, project, um, which is a, um, probably the world's first floating um, multi-turbine structure uh, that we were the designers for. So again, we did the pre-feed feed and detailed design for the Dunray Tri project before that project unfortunately got, um, got canned at the last minute. Um, but since then, that, that, sort of, that sort of concept, that design has moved around the globe. It's now looking at South Korea. I believe there's some other conversations in Spain going on about that structure. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is a very interesting uh, concept. So um, I'd be happy to talk to anyone about that off, offline. Um, so that's a quick overview of some, of some of the projects we've been involved with. Like I said, there's been about 11 in total and uh, ranges from demonstrators to prototypes to some more that are now becoming on a bit more of a commercial, commercial platform. Um, so just a couple of final more slides then, just you go to the next slide, please. Um, as an active member of floating wind industry, we strive to shape and influence the floating wind industry through the involvement in a number of platforms, such as um, being a member, or be actually we were the founding member of Friends of Floating Wind, which is a group of companies uh, set up to shape the industry from policy um, regulatory perspective. We're also a member of Renewable UK Floating Wind Steering Group and we're also a member of the Technical Advisory Boards for a number of floating winds. I would certainly recommend anybody who's looking to jump into offshore wind to get in contact with these with these four as a group or even become an active member because um, there's an awful lot of um, 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 engagement through the supply chain um, um, that can really really sort of help you on your journey there. Um, it just moves to the last slide. Um, We've also been a con contributor to the um, couple of analysis GIP run by DMVGL to develop a new recommended practice for the couple of analysis of floating wind turbine systems. Um, we've been a key part in influencing the direction of that floating wind, the codes and standards from two major classifications for DMV and ABS. We work very closely with, with both of those classification societies. Um, so look, that's a very quick overview. Um, a, a lot of information there, um, giving you a little bit on sort of what we do in off, offshore wind, not just floating, but also fixed. Um, a, a few of the benefits and challenges that floating wind sort of facing as, as we sort of strive forward. Um, some of the selection decision making criteria around sort of floating wind. Um, but if you do have any questions, please get in contact and hopefully this gives you a bit of an idea where Atkins can support Spain in your journey as you start to move offshore. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, again, a vast experience there, so I'm sure you'll be of value to, to the Spanish companies listening today and, and others who we can put you in touch with. So over to, to Tim. Sorry, Tim, and thanks for your patience. Um, uh, Tim works for Flotation Energy, which, as the name suggests, is the greatest expertise and the company lies in floating offshore, but they also work in, in fixed uh, structures. So they have also been involved in the uh, world's largest grid connected floating wind farm, the King Cardine offshore wind farm in Scotland. And they work with project partners to consent and develop new offshore wind projects and, and joint ventures with local companies in Asia, Europe, and in North America. So over to you, Tim. Thank you, Marianne. Apologies, I disappeared once or twice. I've got two kids well, going mental. Down well, there. it's probably night for you now, isn't it? Night time. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah, it's all right, it's all good. Right. Uh, I won't wait for the slides to come up. I'll just crack on just to sort of save time. I think we're 20 minutes over by now, which isn't too bad. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Um, yeah, Flotation Energy. Uh, my name is Tim Sawyer. So I lead the international um, project development side of Flotation Energy. Uh, as a team in the UK, we've got offices in Taiwan and Australia now. Um, and I'll give you, I thought I'd give you an overview of the company, a bit about the King Kardan project. 
Um, and then a few sort of thoughts, I guess, on where floating wind is going as well. So Flotex Energy are an offshore wind developer, formed a couple of years ago and focused very much on fixed in the UK and floating. Um, internationally, we focus much more on floating. We've got a pretty unique track record and expertise. Um, I guess combined, we developed some three gigawatts worth of fixed offshore wind um, that starts with things like the Beatrice Offshore Wind Demonstrator, which is the middle top picture there, uh, which was at the time the deepest jacket structures and the largest turbines uh, next to one gas field. Um, that's then expanded out into the Beatrice 588 megawatt offshore wind farm, which was the is now the fourth largest in the world, um, which we're involved in developing that, and Inch Cape and Moray Firth. So a fair amount of fixed offshore wind. And then in 2013, um, the founding directors of Flotation, which is um, Alan McCaskill and Nicole Stephen, um, conceived the King Cardine project. They saw an opportunity there for a, a floating wind project, um, proceeded to develop that very early, uh, and then bring it to where it is now, which I'll come back to later. Um, at the moment, we're focused, focused on UK leasing rounds, which is basically um, round four in England and Wales, which interesting enough does not exclude floating wind. It's not necessarily focused on it, but it doesn't exclude it. Um, and also Scott wind, uh, which has got a lot of, um, the, one of the first sort of commercial leases, leasing rounds available to floating as well. We're also involved in the energy transition, which is basically combining oil and gas infrastructure with uh, offshore wind uh, and into international development uh, as well into Taiwan, Japan, Australia, etc. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'll, I'll just wait for the next slide. We've heard a lot about the market. So that's the benefit of going last sometimes is other people cover the detail for you. So uh, thanks to Bruce and Chris. Um, but I'll pick up on a couple of points. Um, obviously, offshore wind is developed, or is developing very quickly now. It's taken a couple of decades or more to get to this point, and a lot of work, a lot of risk to get there. Um, it's no different for floating. Um, if you're doing new things in new places, it is hard, and I think the previous speakers will testify to that. Um, and a lot of the growth that we're now seeing is, is in Europe still, and, but it's also coming out into Asia as well which represents a pretty big export market for fixed and indeed floating offshore wind. There's been a lot of growth and the costs uh, have fallen. If you just use the UK contracts for difference as a metric, which is, it's got its challenges, I admit, but um, it's arguably down at the sort of 40, 50 uh, euros a megawatt hour, somewhere around there, um, in a location with a very mature supply chain, a lot of experience. And it'll be interesting to see how that translates into these newer markets in Asia and indeed into, into Spain. Um, turbine size is increasing. We, we heard uh, before the Sophia project now looking at 14 megawatts. There's larger turbines on the agenda. And a lot of UK developers at least are now applying for consent for 300 meter high structures offshore. So it's all an indication of where things are going. And of course, wind is emerging as well. Um, I'll just make one last point that um, Marianne touched on. The UK government now has floating wind in their policy agenda uh, as part of this 40 gigawatt target and the realisation that perhaps we're running out of room for fixed for various reasons, uh, which is a really positive step and that's where things like Scott Wind also come in as well. And that's a really good signal I think for Spain that the UK is prepared to put that into a policy setting and to back it and there's now a consultation as well on um, a floating offshore wind contract, contract for difference, which is great. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we've heard a bit about floating offshore wind, um, lots of benefits, namely, we've got a lot of fixed in shallower waters, typically less than maybe 50 meters. Uh, as you go deeper and as you're forced to go deeper, um, floating structures become more viable. Um, if you look at places, Spain's a good example, very uh, steeply shelving seabed. Japan, the same sort of thing, 80% or more of their offshore wind resources in deeper water. And these sort of areas represent big markets where floating is going to take off and where perhaps there's limited fixed offshore wind. Provides lots of benefits, uh, and I think Chris went through some of those in terms of being further offshore, so you get 
more wind resource, a cleaner resource, arguably. Um, by having floating structures, it offers the opportunity for onshore assembly and commissioning of the whole structure and towing offshore. That, of course, needs a suitable port infrastructure to go with it. More efficient offshore activities um, creates new commercial opportunities for supply chain. And that's a really important point, I think, for Spain is a question of do, does Spain want to be a leader in floating offshore wind or does it want to be a follower? And I think the benefits of being a leader is you get more of that supply chain benefit, more of the technology developments, etc. cetera. Um, costs are projected to fall and uh, Chris... Um, and I think Bruce provided some good detail on that. Um, and they expected to fall fairly quickly, leveraging off fixed offshore wind and um, the evolution of the technology and the amount of projects going at the moment. Um, figures vary for fixed offshore wind, 25 gigawatts installed worldwide, something like that. Floating somewhere around the 50, 60 megawatts installed worldwide, which is very, very little in comparison. Yet the costs are, are not too far off already. Um, so that for me is a promising sign that they'll come down fairly quickly. And it is on the cusp of commerciality. We've had pilot projects, we've had demonstration projects. And that brings me on to the next slide on King Cardine. Um, this was a project in development since 2013. Uh, Alan McCaskill and Nicole Stephen conceived this project, then worked uh, with Atkins um, to bring that through the development phase uh, and eventually brought in ACS Cobra, a Spanish EPC engineering procurement construction company, um, to form what is really a major um, joint venture between UK and Spain in Kincardine in Offshore, uh, in the, um, to do with Kincardine Offshore Wind Limited. And we continue to cooperate with ACS Cobra. Um, it will be, when it's fully constructed, the largest floating offshore wind farm in the world. Um, at the moment, there's a, there's a small two megawatt floating unit out there. Um, and as we speak, there are five semi-submersible uh, foundations being constructed with installation um, due at the end of this year, the summer of this year in the UK, of five 9.5 megawatt turbines, um, MHI Vestas uh, V164s. So it's not only the biggest floating project uh, that will be commissioned and grid connected and operating, it's also got the largest turbines, arguably on the largest basis. So um, it's not an insignificant project. Um, it's got a lot of technical challenges, but it shows, I think, that it's the floating is on the cusp of commerciality. It's gone from single unit demonstrators to a 50 megawatt floating wind farm, and there is an awful lot more floating activity in the world. Um, it will be in the gigawatts of planned projects for floating, um, and more coming as well. Um, so, project completion is 2020, subject to what will be the impacts of COVID, where we've lost a month or two in terms of construction, but very exciting project. Uh, the photo you see is of the two megawatt floating machine that's out off uh, Aberdeen, 15 kilometers of Aberdeen, and the same site will be the other five, 9.5 megawatt machines as well. Um, the next slide, please. Um, this just gives you a sense, I guess, of scale. Uh, this is one of the floating foundations. They're three cans effectively in a triangular shape, um, PPI design, um, and you can see it's a man circled there in red that just gives you a better sense of scale of, of these semi-submersibles. Um, and on that note, I guess semi-submersibles, I would suggest are the current leading floating foundation technology. Uh, there are, of course, others in semi-submersibles, intentionally platforms and hybrids. But this certainly is the most mature. And for Kincard, and it was selected because of that as a project finance um, a project that's project financed, uh, we needed that um, technology to be proven um, as much as we could and de-risk uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of a, a global floating wind market, um, there's quite a lot of activity going on. A lot of it is centered around the UK uh, with Kincardine and with High Wind, uh, demonstration projects in France, uh, Portugal, etc. A fair bit in Japan, a lot of it centered around spa boys. An awful lot of interest globally, though. Um, sure, there's Scott Wind, which is attracting an awful lot of attention in the UK, um, with floating in particular. Um, you may have read recently, Tokyo Gas have now partnered with PPI, Jira, which is another Japanese joint venture, is partnered with Ideol. 
lots of acquisitions of projects in South Korea on the floating side of things. So there's a lot of excitement, a lot of movement going on in the developing world, which kind of lays the pathway up for that commercialization. Um, and I suggest really where we're looking for next, which fits a bit with Bruce's talk, is into those sort of 100, 300 megawatt type projects that are your early commercial projects, trying to increase scale and get economies of scale as well. Um, if we go to, and I look, I hope that Spain is, is part of that um, development. Um, and I think it could well be in the Northwest. There's obviously deep water resource. Um, and if that policy support's put in place and there's careful planning, I think it could do very well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so flotation's business model is we typically do the early development projects and then we want to bring in local partners into those projects um, that want to get into floating offshore wind or indeed fix, maybe don't know how, we can offer some of that comfort and guidance to do that. So we're very much in a partnership model. Um, we bring unique expertise across a lot of fixed uh, and in the Concarden project and other floating wind projects we're now developing as well. We're very active in the current UK leasing rounds. Um, we're developing further projects in Europe and Australia and Asia. Um, and look, I think we'd be a strong partner. So if anyone's interested from the Spanish side of things, we would be grateful to hear from you. We're obviously active at the moment with ACS Cobra in that joint venture for Kinkaran and indeed DT Birds as a monitoring mm -hmm. system, which is Spanish origins as well. Um, I'll leave it there. Hopefully I've galloped through as much as I can in as short a time as possible, but thank <coughs> you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tim and, and everybody else. Yeah, you mentioned King Cardini is really a great example of how UK, Spain joining forces to really serve, you know, come up with this really exciting wind farm in Scotland. So hopefully we'll have uh, more of those examples in the future. Um, okay, so let's just move on. I mean, as you know, we're running late. Let's, I'm going to check out the questions. Um, Okay, so I've got a question here. We're going, we're going winding back now a little bit um, to, to the biogas uh, session. And uh, there's a, a question for Sandra Sasso. Uh, which is the largest project that you've um, developed with the FlexiBuster system? Can you hear me, Sandra? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay, still there, um, good. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you for the question. The, the system is scalable, so, but generally when we get to a certain amount of waste, it no longer makes sense to put modular systems in, unless it's because the site needs to distribute the processing capacity. So, you know, theoretically, there's no limit to the amount of waste that we could process, but it will be uh, groups of modules. So the largest module set that we do for food waste is two and a half tons a day and the largest uh, set for um, the sewage and animal manure is substantially larger than that, um, depending on the type of, of slurry that's being put in. So we go up to 15 digesters um, tied into the modular system. So um, the largest one that we've done uh, or that we're currently doing is a 10 ton system. Uh, so 10 tons a day of processing capacity on the food waste side. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, question for Nicholas. Um, in the, it says, I'm, I'm translating this in Spanish. In the presentation, Spain was one of the countries that had installations. Uh, which the departments are already operating in our country, in Spain? Nicholas? Okay. Not there, Nicholas? No? Okay, so question for Bruce. He's mute, um, he's mute Marianne. He's answering, but he's mute. He's in mute. Uh, you, you hear me now? You hear me now? Oh, it's you okay? can hear now, yeah, go on. Yes. Yes, as I explained, we don't have any department in, in Spain. I'm taking care of Spain from France, from Lyon. Okay. But I, uh, we have a partner uh, in, uh, Spain, in Spain, which name is Mille Casa, which have an office in Barcelona and in um, or to say in uh, Riron, in uh, Asturias. You hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, thank you, thank you. And a question so, for, for Bruce um, and others really on, on the floating session. Um, as experts in uh, wind uh, development and floating wind especially, 
what are the challenges that you think that uh, floating wind in Spain and what future do you hope for what what future does the development have here sure so I think uh, Spain has some challenge of competing on cost with onshore wind and solar in the future energy mix have to look at volumes and things to to assess that um, there's also a pretty uh, severe wave climate uh, you've got the Atlantic Ocean uh, key will be the development of the supply chain especially uh, ports and freeing up enough port space uh, for manufacture and uh, and then dispatch of the uh, the equipment for the floating uh, offshore wind farms um, I mean, Spain has got a, had a very positive story in onshore wind uh, and, and there's been a real leader there. So I think we're, we're, we're optimistic about the future of floating offshore wind um, in, in Spain. You have um, Iberdrola uh, and Siemens Gamesa um, as, as leading players in the, in, in the space already. Um, so key will be the development of the, yeah, of the, of the local uh, supply chain, but you're already exporting uh, bottom fixed foundations um, around Europe and things. So I think every chance of success. Okay, well, thank you very much. Actually, I think I think we're going to leave that there because we really run over time. Um, I'm conscious that you know we've gone over sort of a good 20 minutes. So I think um, we all have the details. Uh, you've given us the details that all the speakers and the, and the two and the two panel sessions. Um, also, I've given our details out in Spain. Um, I'm in Madrid, as you know, Carolina's in Barcelona. We've got our colleague Nick in, in Bilbao. So anything more that you need, any more information you'd like to have from the speakers, from us about opportunities for working or, or looking for partners in the UK, please get in touch with us. Um, thank you very much to ABBA for co-hosting with us uh, this event this morning. Um, we've been pretty ambitious trying to get and to, to get squeeze the two te uh, technologies into an hour and a half but no doubt you know i think it's been successful we'll probably do more sort of focused um webinars um, after the summer uh, on each of the technologies to be able to develop them a bit further so thank you all very much again thank you and, very much um, also from the state of Saba. thank you okay all right goodbye everybody thanks all Bye. Bye now. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. bye.